Well, good evening and a very happy Easter to you. Uh, my name is Luke. I'm one of the assistant ministers here at Christchurch Leighton. Let me pray for us uh, before we dive into our passage this evening. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the resurrection of our Lord and Saviour Jesus. Please help us to understand and wonder at it afresh this evening. We pray this for his sake. Amen. Well, this evening, we're going to be considering two questions and two questions covered and answered by the passage that Fiona just read for us. Two questions that I want to suggest are probably the most important questions you could ever ask. And I say that well aware that many of us are asking some very serious and solemn questions at the moment. Here they are. Who is Jesus? And why should I believe in him? Who is Jesus and why should I believe in him? The, the reason that I am so convinced that these two questions are of the utmost importance for all of us today is something that John says at the end of our passage. And because John says that not only is Jesus the Messiah, um, the saviour and king of the whole world, in fact, he is fully divine, not only that, um, but also eternal life hinges on whether or not we believe in him. Now that is life as it was meant to be, a life that we dream of in the lockdown, the life that we will still long for even when the lockdown ends. That life, eternal life, depends on whether we believe in Jesus. I wonder if you spotted that in the last two verses of our passage. Take a look with me, uh, chapter 20, beginning at verse 30. Here is John, author of this gospel, friend of Jesus, companion of Jesus, explaining why it is that he put pen to paper, why he wrote this gospel. He says this, chapter 20, beginning at verse 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Are you beginning to see why these two questions could just be the most important questions you ask this week and this year? Or life? Who is Jesus? And why should I believe in him? Now at this point you may well be thinking, well hang on a minute Luke, I already am a Christian, I already believe in Jesus. I mean those questions basically sound pretty irrelevant to me if I'm honest. Well if that's you, then can I urge you not to switch off? And because belief in the Bible is never something you do once and then forget all about, and like getting a vaccination. No, the Christian faith, being a Christian, following Jesus is like a marathon. You keep going and going and going. True believers keep on believing. Which means all of us, all of us need to keep on asking these two questions. Who is Jesus? And why should I believe in him? And why? Why do we need to ask those questions? Well, the answer is so that we are prepared for those times when doubts or temptations come. You see, if you believe in Jesus that for any length of time, then doubts, they will certainly arise. And because actively following Jesus, not just sort of calling yourself a Christian, but actually following Jesus, well, it's costly. It puts you in a minority and so you find yourself wandering. Is it really worth it? Am I crazy? Am I wasting my life for a lie? And perhaps you've experienced those sort of doubts in just the last week. And perhaps you've experienced those doubts the whole of your Christian life. You're constantly on and off. And what's more, temptation is sure to come. And temptation to tone it down, you know, blend in with the crowd, or perhaps even just, just give up. 
And because the grass, it often looks greener on the other side. And so you find yourself thinking, my, my unbelieving friends, they have such good lives. They seem to have it so good. Would, would my life be better if I was a little bit more like them? And what's more, loads of the teaching in the Bible sort of seems dated, hated. Wouldn't my life be easier, better, if I just sort of dropped some of that stuff? Doubts will come. Temptations will arise. And so we need to keep on asking those questions. Who is Jesus? Can I be sure? And what is he like? And why should I keep on believing in him? Well, our passage this evening answers those questions. It tells us that Jesus is Lord and God. And it tells us that we should believe in him because of his resurrection. God raised Jesus from the dead. Let's tuck in to our passage then and see that that's the case. First, though, let me bring us up to speed with the story so far. You see, we joined the disciples on Easter Sunday evening, but a lot has already happened. We heard about it actually in the morning service. And firstly, the disciples have discovered Jesus's tomb is empty. And that is Jesus, their friend, their teacher, who died on Friday. He was buried in a tomb and now that tomb is empty, vacant. The stone rolled away, the grave closed, they lie vacant. Nowhere to be seen is the body of Jesus. More than that, though, secondly, Mary Magdalene, one of the loyal followers of Jesus, she has seen Jesus alive in the garden. And she's told the disciples. And so at the beginning of our passage, verse 19, we join the disciples at a very strange moment, don't we? Can you imagine the sort of emotions floating around the room? Grief. Grief. They've recently witnessed the man that they gave up everything to follow everything. The man they trusted, the man they loved, he's been humiliated, beaten, killed, nailed to a cross, crucified on a Roman cross. Almost all of them deserted him, ran away in his time of need, and now his body has gone missing. Suspense. Did Mary really see him? Jesus promised they'd see him soon, but can it really be true? After all, dead people don't come back to life. But if there's one man who could, suspense. And then finally, fear. And the Jewish leaders, they hated Jesus. They hounded him to death. Perhaps the disciples would be next. Fear. And so the disciples, they're in lockdown, but then something astonishing happens. Jesus comes and stands among them. Look with me, beginning at verse 19. These are incredible verses. Verse 19. On that evening, at the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Um, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, I love picturing this scene. And the disciples perhaps sitting together, some chatting, trying to get their heads around everything that's gone on. Some perhaps just, just sitting in silence, thinking it through. And then one of them maybe looks up. And there is Jesus. Perhaps he lets out a loud, loud cry. And now they're all staring at Jesus. Their eyes transfixed to them. He shows his hands. He shows them his side. And his hands, because that's where they drove the nails to fix him to the cross. His side, because that's where they pierced him with a spear to prove he was dead. And the message is clear as he does this. It's me. It's really me. It's Jesus. I'm alive. Tears of joy, gasps of astonishment, excited chatter. I have no idea how the disciples would have responded in this moment, but you can just imagine the scene, can't you? The sheer joy of seeing Jesus alive again. Uh, 
little bit like that moment in the airport arrivals lounge, you know, when you're there to meet the person you love most in the world. As they walk through the doors and they don't catch your eyes straight away, but then you lock eyes and just beams come out of your faces. You cannot help but smile to see one another. And that is like tiny compared to what's happening with the disciples here, isn't it? There stands Jesus. And the disciples, they're overjoyed. They are over the moon. Now they know for sure God has raised Jesus from the dead. It's not just the disciples, though, who can be confident that Jesus rose again. We can be confident too. Why? Well, because all the evidence points in that direction. The evidence suggests that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And let's take a look at the facts. And fact one, Jesus really died. And that is, Jesus was a real person who really died, crucified on a Roman cross. And, and we know this, not just from Christian sources, but from non-Christians as well. And like the Roman historian Tacitus. And you see, Jesus didn't, didn't faint on the cross and revive in the tomb. He was beaten within inches of his life, crucified by professional soldiers, declared dead by a Roman centurion. And his side was pierced and blood and water flowed out, a sure sign that he really was dead. Jesus really died. Fact two, he was buried. And the very earliest accounts of Jesus's life, written within a decade of his death, confirm that he was buried. And in the centuries following Jesus' death, no one disputed that fact. There is no counter narrative. No one suggested otherwise. We have no competing stories. And what's more, he was buried in the tomb of a well-known member of the Jewish council, actually the same council that condemned him to death. And so not only did his followers know the location of his tomb, and so too did his enemies. Jesus was buried. Fact three, his tomb was empty. And that is, on the third day, a group of women, including Mary Magdalene, went to embalm his body, only to discover it wasn't there. And what you need to know is that in the first century, at the testimony of women, it wasn't actually accepted in Jewish courts, and which sounds shocking to us, doesn't it? But it is a significant pointer to the truth of these accounts. And because why would you invent a story in which people discover the empty tomb and their unreliable witnesses in the views of the day? Um, unless, of course, well, that is exactly what happened. And what's more, the Jewish leaders responded to the resurrection by claiming that the disciples had stolen the body. Again, that doesn't seem significant, does it? Except notice, by claiming the disciples have stolen the body, what are they admitting? They are admitting that the tomb is empty, and they assume it in their story. Jesus' tomb was empty. Finally, fact number four. He appeared alive. And that is, multiple people on multiple occasions saw Jesus alive again. And they spoke with him. They saw his hands and his side. And they witnessed him eating bread and fish. And it's highly unlikely that they made that up. Because what did they gain from it? Suffering? A vastly reduced life expectancy? make any money from it. Quite the opposite. Jesus appeared alive. So there we are. And there are the facts. Jesus really died. He was buried. His tomb was empty. And he appeared alive. And the question is, what is the best explanation for the fact? God raised Jesus from the dead. And that's the obvious thing that fixes the facts, isn't it? And which means, by the way, and the Christian faith 
Well, it's entirely reasonable, totally rational. And I say that because there's a popular view out there promoted by um, atheists like Richard Dawkins and um, that the Christian faith is blind faith. And that Christian faith is basically superstitious nonsense. It's evidence less. But you see, the Christian faith, it is grounded in historical fact. Things that happen, it is entirely reasonable. I'd suggest, actually, it is the most reasonable explanation of the evidence. See, I'm convinced that if you approach the resurrection with an open mind, that is, if you approach the resurrection having not already decided that people can't rise from the dead, because if you decided already that people can't rise from the dead, well, of course he didn't, did he? But actually, if you look at the evidence without having made that decision, well, then the evidence for the resurrection is compelling, isn't it? God raised Jesus from the dead. And by the way, if God is God, surely that is exactly the sort of thing he can do. The question is, why did he do it? Well, that leads us to two earth-shattering implications. And this is the event, by the way, this is the event that changes all of history. Jesus rising from the dead. First implication, the resurrection proves that Jesus has secured eternal life. Secondly, the resurrection proves that Jesus is Lord and God. Let's take this one at a time. So firstly, the resurrection proves that Jesus has secured eternal life. And we learn that from his chat with the disciples. Have a look with me, beginning at verse 21. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, you might be thinking, hang on a minute, Luke. What are you going on about? Jesus doesn't actually mention eternal life here, does he? Well, that's because he focuses in on two of the wonderful features of eternal life. Peace and forgiveness. Peace and forgiveness. See, at one level, peace be with you. Well, it's just an ordinary greeting. I mean, in fact, it's a greeting that's used by millions of Muslims every day, isn't it? Assalamu alaikum. I'm sorry if I've pronounced that badly. Peace be upon you. However, when Jesus says it, it has far, far, far greater significance than just some ordinary little um, greeting, because it captures what Jesus has, has achieved on the cross. See, the word translated peace, uh, shalom, it doesn't simply mean an absence of conflict. No, it means wholeness, completeness, life as it ought to be. And because life often feels like a puzzle with pieces missing, doesn't it? But the life that Jesus offers is the full picture, and he secured it through his death. And what's more, the resurrection proves it. You see, if Jesus had remained dead, well then what grounds would the disciples, would we, have for believing that he has secured peace? And maybe he failed. Or perhaps he was just one more fraudster making promises that he simply couldn't deliver. But God raised Jesus from the dead, proving that he secured our peace. And what's more, he secured our forgiveness. Did you see that? Forgiveness of sins. And we thought about this last Sunday evening. We thought about this again on Thursday and Friday. This is right at the heart of the Easter message, isn't it? Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath in the place of his people. And in so doing, he secured their forgiveness. He died so that we might live. Again, his resurrection proves it, doesn't it? Because if he'd remained dead, then what grounds would we have for believing his death had secured our pardon? Maybe he failed. Now, perhaps he's just one more sinner who deserved to die. But God raised Jesus from the dead, proving that he had secured our forgiveness. 
And peace and forgiveness are two of the beautiful facets of eternal life. The resurrection proves that Jesus has secured eternal life for anyone who believes in him. That's not all, though, because secondly, the resurrection proves that Jesus Christ is both Lord and God. And to see this, we need to continue reading in the story and we get to Thomas. You see, when the disciples met Jesus that first Sunday and one of them was missing, Thomas. Can you imagine being Thomas? You know, sort of arriving uh, with the rest of the disciples, perhaps later that day, perhaps later that week, I don't know when it was, and you can immediately tell something's up, right? And everyone rushes towards him. We've seen Jesus. We've seen him. He's alive. He's alive. We can't believe you missed it, Tom. Can you imagine being Thomas? Look with me, starting at verse 24. And now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, uh, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. He said to them, unless I see the nail marks in my hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And the disciples, they weren't gullible pushovers who'd believe whatever you told them. You know, prime for April Fool's jokes. No, Thomas wants proof. He wants physical evidence. And Jesus is kind and compassionate. He loves his people. And so one week later, he appears to Thomas. We continue the story in verse 26. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, because you have seen me and have believed, blessed uh, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Thomas, he sees the risen Lord Jesus face to face and his response is the model response. My Lord and my God. And notice, firstly, that in addition to being reasonable, faith here is personal, isn't it? As well as being rational and faith, it's relational. And Thomas, he doesn't say Lord and God, he says my Lord and my God. And Christian faith, therefore, it is not about knowing facts. It's about knowing and trusting a person, Jesus. Notice also that faith, well, it involves acknowledging Jesus as both Lord and God. And not just an historical figure and not just a nice role model, not just a good teacher, though he is, of course, all of those things, but king of the world, creator of the universe, the man to whom you deserve Deserves your full obedience, your worship, your praise, your whole life. He is Lord and God. How is it, though, that, that Thomas has come to this conclusion? Answer? Well, he met the risen Jesus. The resurrection proves that Jesus is Lord and God. Sorry, I've just got something in my eye. Ooh. The resurrection, it proves that Jesus is Lord and God. But how does that work? And how does the resurrection prove that Jesus is Lord and God? Well, by raising Jesus from the dead, God, it's as if he declares, this is my son. He demonstrates to the world, this is the Lord and saviour of the world. See, before Jesus died, he made some huge claims about himself and claims that his crucifixion, his being killed, well, they seem to rather disprove. 
And he claimed he was the long-promised Jewish Messiah, that is, the man who would end evil, eliminate illness, defeat death, and save sinners. He claimed he was Lord, and the King of the world. And he claimed he was God's Son, equal with God, fully divine, huge claims. And so the religious leaders, they hated it, and they got him killed. And they proved he was a liar by doing that, didn't they? Because God can't die and the Messiah, well, he would live forever. They proved Jesus wrong. Or so they thought. Because death couldn't hold Jesus, God raised him from the dead, demonstrating to the world that Jesus really is his son. The resurrection proves that Jesus is both Lord and God. And the disciples, they believed it. Thomas, he believed it. And God wants us to believe it too. He wants us to believe in his son, Jesus, and in so doing to receive eternal life. And but you might be thinking, and we're in a completely different situation to the disciples, aren't we? The disciples, they saw Jesus. Well, we haven't. Isn't that a bit of a problem? How can we? Jesus is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead? Well, that's a good question. And the answer is, we can know today through the witness of others, and through the testimony of those who saw him, people like John, who wrote this gospel. And that's exactly the same as how we believe in any other historical event, isn't it? And for example, do you believe that World War II took place? And do you uh, believe that King Henry VIII um, existed, was king, ruled over England? Now, I hope you do believe in those things. I, I believe they happened. Um, but if you do, why do you? Well, we trust those events took place because of the testimony of others, don't we? We listen to what people who were there tell us. And they recorded it, they wrote it down. We can therefore be confident it happened. Here's the point. We can trust that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. Because whilst we haven't seen him, we have got the testimony of those who did. People like John who wrote this gospel, we can access the events as they really happened. And it's why reading the Gospels is such a wonderful thing, because you're reading about a real person who is wonderful. I mean, if you've never read a Gospel before, read a Gospel. If you've read a Gospel before, read a Gospel. Meet Jesus. And John, he actually wrote this Gospel so that we might meet Jesus and believe in him. Look again with the verse we began with, um, verse 30 and verse 31. And this is why John wrote his gospel. He says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. And notice one final time, John is not encouraging us into sort of blind faith. No, he wants us to uh, believe in events that really happened, that he personally witnessed. Let us then return to those two questions we began with. Who is Jesus? And why should I believe in him? Why should I keep on believing in him? And even as loads of people aren't, even as it looks better sometimes, live a life where I'm not believing in Jesus. When those temptations, those doubts come, why should I keep believing in him? Well, says John, who is he? Jesus is Lord and God. He is king of the world and creator of the universe. He is the Messiah and through his death, he has secured eternal life, peace and forgiveness. And we should believe in him because of his resurrection God raised Jesus from the dead, proving him to be both Lord and God. Praise God for the resurrection of Jesus and a very happy Easter.
you all. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus rose from the dead. Thank you that we can therefore trust he is Lord and God. Thank you that he secured eternal life, peace and forgiveness for all who believe in him. Please help us to believe today. Please help us to keep on believing in him. Amen.